we good to go, Danielle? Yep, we're good to go. Great. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, a beautiful freezing cold wet night in Melbourne for our I Can Sustain Perfect Asthma Weather. Um, so tonight we are talking about implementing clinical practice guidelines for asthma and allergic rhinitis as part of the I Can Sustain. Thank you all for taking time out of your evenings to be here and contribute. Um, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay respects to the elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today for the, the keep safe, safekeepers of memories, traditions and cultures. We recognise their connection to country, land, sea and community, and the role in caring for and maintaining country over thousands of years. May their strength and wisdom be with us today. So a little bit on housekeeping, just in case you're not familiar with our Zoom meetings. All attendees are muted. Please keep your microphone on mute, unless of course you want to ask a question, in which case you can unmute yourself. Feel free to interrupt. This is all very casual. Or you can raise your hand and we shall happily ask you to unmute. Um, you can also ask questions via the chat box. We will be monitoring that. If you think uh, we've missed your question, just ask it again, okay? Um, we will be sort of looking as much as we can, but if you feel it's not been answered, please do ask it again. We want to answer these questions. The session is being recorded and you'll be able to access that recording. We'll talk about how at the end of the session. And please ensure you join the session using the name that you registered with so that we can mark your attendance. We cannot give CPD, um, uh, we can't issue it if we don't have the correct name on there. Um, so how you change your name in the Zoom meeting, you click on participate, participants, uh, go to the app, click on your name, um, on the desktop, you hover over your name and the Mac, you hover over your name and click more, then you rename and then enter whatever name you registered with. So today's agenda, um, I am doing welcome and introductions and then um, transitioning from last year's I Can Inner West to I Can Sustain will be um, Catherine. Then we are having some case discussions regarding the implementation of the clinical guidelines that we discussed at the beginning of the year um, by Catherine. Unfortunately, Amy can't join us today, um, so it will be Catherine and everybody who is welcome to join in that case discussion. And then I'll be doing a review of the allergic rhinitis guideline and thunderstorm asthma, and then Catherine will be wrapping up for us this evening. Our learning outcomes for your CPD, you should be able to implement best practice um, management for asthma in children, describe resources and local services available for children living with asthma, identify collaborative multidisciplinary opportunities to improve care for children living with asthma, and we'll interpret some local data and identify potential solutions to improve asthma care locally. So I'd ask you all now to introduce yourself into the chat uh, with your name, your role and your organisation. And I would like to remind everybody here that we have two wonderful consumers with us this evening. So if you are um, giving cases or using any technical medical language to try and make it as easily understandable as possible, uh, they are uh, professional consumers, um, but we like it to be inclusive so everybody can participate. While you're all introducing yourselves, uh, I'll introduce us. Um, so we have with us uh, tonight, Dr. Catherine Chen, who is a general pediatrician at the Royal Children's Hospital. Catherine wears many hats and is very much involved in the Asthma ICAM uh, project. She's also a head of the short state unit at the Children's. And um, this is me, a very close up picture. I am a GP in Chuganina. Um, I have a special interest in paediatrics and asthma and allergy, um, because if you've not lived or worked in Truganina, um, it's, um, it's pretty wheezy out there. We also are very lucky to be joined tonight uh, by Dr. Shiv Shantikumar, who is a paediatric respiratory specialist at the Royal Children's, a clinical scientist fellow at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, and has been a great contributor to a lot of these sessions so far, and we are very thankful for having him here today. 
So I will leave it with Catherine to transition to tell us about transitioning from I can inner west to I can sustain. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Kirsty, for the introduction. I'm just looking at the chat and really excited to see many new names and new faces joining us tonight. For those that are new to ICAM, which stands for Improving Childhood Asthma Management Project, we've been running the last year funded by the Department of Health, aiming with the primary focus on inner west, because we noticed that in this cohort of children, there's high rates of needing to come to emergency and hospitals. It was a big project um, and involved many, many groups coming together, including general practice, hospital, community nurses, peak bodies, such as the National Asthma Council, Asthma Australia, um, and Safer Care Victoria. And one of the key features that has we found the most useful was the community of practice. And what it meant was a lot of us coming together. It was initially once a month where we share um, new evidence practice guidelines. We share some local data that help guide our practice. And we often have topics that we invite expert speakers to update us on. So with the ICAM system, what we hope to do moving forwards is to embed this in existing um, services. So at the moment, we are very well supported by the Northwest Melbourne PHN um, that they have organized and help support the back end administration of this. So with the aim of the sustain phase is trying to see whether this work could be ongoing with limited funding so that we will contribute to this as part of our clinical role. Um, so the two main goals is to sustain and I think to spread. So on that phase, in the next three years, what this is I can sustain will be roll out on. We hope to run these um, community of practice initially every two months and then eventually every three months. We hope that this is of value to you, both for the professional development and also for your patients. And for that end, we hope that it moving forwards will be more of a collaborative process in that we might be more comfortable with each other to bring tricky cases or tricky issues um, and understand the value of this forum. I mean, in my hospital practice, it's so rare that I get this chance to speak with so many different um members of the team that looks after children with asthma. And I think this is the value and the power in this group. So I hope moving forwards, we'll get to know each other and then we'll all feel comfortable about bringing tricky cases um, and tricky issues to discussion. For today, because it is the first one, I'm going to be sharing um, one of the cases that I see in hospital, but going forward, hopefully we can have you reaching out to us for these kind of cases. At the end, I'll share some technologies that we could use to share information discussion with each other in between this community of practice. Um, and in terms of spread, we're now inviting, hopefully pediatricians, general practitioners, community practitioners in the hopefully beyond the inner west to join us and looking at some of the introductions, um, I can see that this is already happening. So that's wonderful. And um, so I might um, move on next to the case discussions. I will join, share my screen. Just checking, is everyone seeing my screen okay? Yep, perfect, all right. All right, so I'll just have to fast forward a little bit to the part. Okay, um, so the purpose of today is to think about how we implement best practice guideline in our practice Part of the ICAM project, we were funded by the department um, and led by Shiv Shantikuma, our respiratory physician, in developing a preschool asthma um, guideline. It was relatively new, and I'm sure when we're using on the ground, there will be some teething issues um, and the iterative process of learning. So hopefully this case will bring up some of the issues relating to that guideline, and we welcome any kind of feedback or discussion. So this patient is one that I saw just a few weeks ago in the short stay unit of the children's hospital. So he's a 19 month old boy, previously relatively well, term baby, no significant atopic history. And what I mean by atopic is he didn't have um, eczema or food allergies. There was no significant family history of asthma. He, however, had been in emergency twice in his short life um, 
when he was an infant with bronchiolitis. And he also had one emergency presentation just two months ago, where he present with wheeze in a setting of having a virus. Um, at that point on the note, it said that he was responsive to salbutamol. In between these episodes, he was very well. He could run around as much as he could. There was no disturbance in his sleep or um, there was no cough or wheeze when he was well. Both of his parents smoke. Um, and he had two older sisters that were attending kinder and school and lots of avenue of brain viruses back to his home. He has not had his 18 month immunization of flu vaccine because he just hasn't been well long enough for his parents to take him um, to have that done. So he was in emergency and he presented with four days history of fever, runny nose and cough. He was seen by a local respiratory clinic and, and he was positive for rhinovirus and human metanumovirus um, at the same time. At that point, he had three days of oral prednisolone, which his parents felt that probably hasn't really made a significant difference um, to his clinical presentation. And the rightfully, they're represented again to their GP because of increasing shortness of breath. He was starting to look a little bit blue around his mouth and his hands, and his GP rightfully called the ambulance. When he arrived to us, he was his oxygen saturations were in the low 90s and received standard oxygen therapy for a few hours. He was given salbutamol as required, um, and the documentation at that point was he was responsive um, to some extent to the salbutamol. He wasn't given any further oral steroids as he responded quite quickly and turned the corner um, quite quickly. So I'm just going to pause here for some um, issues for discussion and follow up. Um, and one of the discussions we have now that things have settled down and we had that background in short stay is what do we tell the parents about the diagnosis? You know, parents want to know, is this called asthma? What is it called? Um, and what should be the management going forwards? Um, so I'm just going to open the floor on discussion. I understand this is probably a common case that most of you would see um, in your clinic or in a hospital emergency on a regular basis. So interested in some feedback on how um, clinicians may go about with the issue of diagnosis. As you said, Catherine, we've got lots of familiar faces here tonight. We've also got lots of new faces and I am enjoying seeing so many GPs here this time because I think this is really pertinent to us. And I would say this is a case I see um, several times a week. Um, and I think the messaging still within the community about what we say is the diagnosis and the use of oral steroids still isn't there yet. I've certainly not seen any change um, <laughs> locally. Um, still lots of people presenting, being told various things, you know, oh, I've just got a virus, oh, it's just viral wheeze, oh, it's bronchiolitis still at this stage, oh, no, it's definitely asthma. And a lot of kids still getting steroids. Um, I would say that all the kids that I've referred to the community asthma programme and that have been referred to me from the hospital and are on board, and when they do see other people um, in the community or in ED, um, they're very much strong in the messaging, and I think that's really helped. So it'd be really interesting to know from practitioners who maybe haven't been with us over the last year um, what they would tell patients, what they're used to telling patients um, and, and how they how they might phrase this. And um, there's no wrong answers. Um, and feel free to type in the chat box as well. Everybody's shy this evening. It warms up, I promise. <laughs> yeah, often our trouble is trying to end discussions at the end of this, isn't it? Because they, it does warm up. But maybe while everyone's putting a chat box, we have Shiv, our respiratory physician, which led the development of the preschool asthma guideline. Maybe I'll invite Shiv just to talk about what are the key, well, I guess, changes or the main key differences that 
in the guideline that may vary from perhaps more usual practice. Um, Shiv, is that all right? Yeah, of course. Um, so so uh, I, I, I think one of the things that um, we tried to do with the guideline was that I think there was lots of confusion and overcomplication of wheezing in the preschool, like one to five-year-old age group. And people use lots of different terms and had different ideas about management and and like what was appropriate to do and what was not appropriate to do. And I don't think there was really clear guidelines anywhere. And so that meant we were all confused. And uh, that meant if we were all confused across the healthcare system, of course, parents were all confused. And um there is a need for us all to do the same thing in that we know that in the current healthcare system um, that people often move between GPs uh, and practices and often are seen in ED and by different specialists. And so if we're all doing something different, you can imagine how hard that is if you're the, the patient's parent. So, so uh, the idea with the guidelines was to have one way of doing things and, and, and a pretty simple way that we could all follow. And so, so simplistically, uh, first about what to call this, so and what to diagnose it as well. If someone has symptoms of asthma, so things like wheezing is the main one, and and cough and shortness of breath, and they respond to asthma treatment, i.e., the wheezing goes away with Ventolin, and that's observed by a health professional, then I think they have asthma. So we just call it preschool asthma, and then then I think that's there's something really powerful about that because then we all know which guideline to look at, the preschool asthma guideline. We all have, there's no confusion about giving someone an asthma action plan because we've told them they have asthma um, and parents can look for support from asthma groups. We get community asthma nurses involved because we know that they're helpful and like, like it just creates this beautiful clarity. Whereas when we call it other things like, I know I personally, I used to use terms like viral induced wheeze, um, reactive airways, well then like things like that, um, preschool wheeze that's uh, you know maybe there's some I'm not saying that that's like 100% wrong to do it's just that then it gets confusing because there's no guidelines with those as the name um, it's very confusing if you tell someone they don't have asthma they've got viral induced wheeze but then give them an asthma action plan and refer them to a community asthma nurse and things like that so anyway uh, this child preschooler with symptoms of asthma that respond to asthma treatment I would call it preschool asthma. Hmm. And that's exactly what we did. And that perhaps changed some of our practice. I think in the hospital, we recognize a shift that we really are a very small part of the children's journey. And it's very important for us to think about how this integrates in this overall journey in the community and the GP and their kinder and then eventually their school. So we streamlined this and gave this young um child the preschool asthma which means that we gave this child an asthma action plan he went home with a spacer salbutamol and the family were educated on what to do if he does develop symptoms again because did I see your hand up briefly just now yes I was playing around with things but it was just more for the um the people who aren't so pediatric based and um, so the practice nurses and GPs I've had this really important change in my practice for my adult population as well so we know we often see people grow out of asthma. I would still classify people who have the ability to wheeze and who have had reactive airways on asthma plans in the preschool time, maybe grown out even around the age six, seven, eight. They often forget about it. They don't know about it. Or it's not being clearly educated that this is asthma. Two scenarios this comes back as. When I'm assessing an adult of any age with persistent cough or breathlessness and I ask if they're asthmatic and they say no, and I have to specify, did you ever have an inhaler when you're little? And something which we'll talk about later, thunderstorm asthma. I'll tell you about my experience with thunderstorm asthma. None of the people I saw that night were asthmatic, but they were all asthmatic. So I found a real clarity in my practice of asthma is asthma. You grow out of it. It's relapsing and remitting. We all know that. So as opposed to sort of diminishing it or calling it something else, you have reactive airways or you don't. And it's useful clinical information for the rest of their life, actually. And I'm not saying every kid who's got preschool wheeze will end up wheezy at some point the rest of their life, but they might. And the way I framed my questioning for adult patients and really persevered on that tack saying, have you really ever had a Ventolin um, has been much more useful in trying to diagnose adult asthmatics.
And so we briefly touched base um, on the use of oral steroid, which I think is one of the main things discussed in this guideline regarding um, that shift. Would you like to discuss this point um, around the use of oral steroids yeah. in the preschool um, asthma? Yes, I'm happy to. Uh, so one of the points in the guideline, the, the guideline has a few different sections. And I, and I should say, I'm really delighted to see Scott um, Parsons online because um, Scott has done the health pathways um, for many conditions, but is in the process or has created one for um, preschool asthma as well, um, which mirrors the RCH clinical practice guideline. So hopefully there's consistency. Um, but uh, in, in both of those documents, one of the sections that is management of acute exacerbations. And we all want to do things that keep that fix symptoms and keep people out of hospital. But we also need to recognise that sometimes we there are things that are beyond our control and we shouldn't use treatments that don't help, particularly if they don't have if they have side effects. And so oral prednisolone in preschool asthma is one of those whereby there are multiple studies now that show that the, in preschoolers with asthma, oral prednisolone has pretty minimal benefit for um, asthma exacerbations. And probably the only group it, they may help are the ones who are admitted to the hospital. So uh, they're not helpful in the community. So as compared to primary school and adolescent asthma, preschoolers with asthma shouldn't get uh, oral prednisolone and really the only thing you can do in the community is um as needed ventolin uh and and so um yeah that's it thanks thanks Shiv. um and the other discussion point we had this with this family at discharge was about the use of preventive medications now if you remember back he had bronchiolitis and then one emergency presentation and that perhaps doesn't meet that kind of severity criteria but we did you know discuss with the family if it does have multiple episodes particularly severe episodes needing to be an emergency um that that would be something to consider but he we didn't give him any maintenance therapy um at this point and same as any other children with asthma we talk about reduction of triggers particularly um the cigarette smoking that he's been exposed to at home and the opportunity to vaccinate um, when he's at febrile and flu vaccines um, at that point. Shiv, you got your hand up? I, I, I'm sorry if you cover this later on, Catherine, but I was just going to yeah. say, it, I agree with that comment about not starting a, a preventer in this child, but I, I guess... Um, if people are wondering about the criteria to start, that's something else that we tried to clearly illustrate in the guideline, clearly outline the guideline is criteria for starting preventer treatment. Um, and I think because she's going to um, screen share her health pathways later just to demonstrate where in the guidelines they would be. Kirsty? I was just going to say on that, Shiv, I had a, I had a question with that. Because um, the guidelines I find are much clearer, much more easy to follow. But again, as a GP, I still find some kids who kind of fall between the gaps. So I'll give a case which is pretty much exactly the same. And please feel free if you have other cases that you're confused about. We have um, lots of experts here. You don't need to sit on hold for 20 minutes to speak to someone. You can just ask them right now. It's great. So I have this patient, this case. Um, strong family history of asthma, though. Um, all the siblings are asthmatic. Dad's badly asthmatic still. Um, and he has been to hospital for birth therapy once, and he has had Ventolin use, not more than twice a week, but every single respiratory infection for four months now. And he's probably had five to six respiratory infections, given steroids once unnecessarily by somebody in the community. When you're sitting in a kid like that, who's atopic, not got any food allergies, too young to assess about hay fever, it's spring, we're moving from end of winter, coughs and colds into spring, the whole family's asthmatic and I'm seeing him almost on a 10 daily basis using a bit of Ventolin, he's under the asthma community nurses, thank you. Um, I, would, 
<laughs> and I, yeah, I like basically said to them, he's he's a couple more attacks away from me putting him on flexatide, and he's always pretty well and responds really well to Ventolin. And it's not even three hour late, but it's a lot of Ventolin. I'm sitting there going, I, I'm pretty sure you're heading towards some flexatide. Yeah. So I, I would um I, I would pretty happily start uh, that child on flexatide or yeah, on flexatide. Um, same thing. But uh. So part, I guess part of the thing with guidelines is that um, they're guidelines and that they might, and it's, it's hard to get it. Um, and I must admit it was very, um, it, it was a painful process writing it because you've you, one, you can't, you kind of can't actually cover every clinical scenario and two, you need to get consensus across a broad group of people. And so um, 100%, I, I think there are probably people who fall through the cracks. I, I think, um, and, and if yeah, and, and particularly with the atopic history and and the frequency of symptoms, and if the parents are on board, I think it's very reasonable to offer them uh, an inhaled corticosteroid. Yeah. yeah, great. And I think the difference in my clinical practice of the last year is really being very confident to the parents. This is asthma, so they understand when you then go on to say you need maintenance. It's not oh, this is viral induced wheeze. We should start a steroid inhaler, and then they think well, what. I Mm -hmm. um and the messaging has been clear the referral to the community asthma program who have we've worked really well and backed each other up and that's the messaging is clear and consistent but also being really clear to the parents this is a period of monitoring i want you to come in every time he's sick and you're using ventolin so i can listen and see what happens because i find that a lot in practice patients are getting ventolin at home every cough or cold and i see them i'm like i'm not i'm not sure you actually do need ventolin here I'm not sure this is wheeze at night. I think you're just snotty and coffee. So I've been really clear to all those sort of intermediate patients, come in so I can see you as much as you can. Um, so in the next slide, which we'll be sending this to everyone, I've put the link to the, this is the Royal Children's Clinical Practice Guideline, but Kirsty will show us where this sits in the health pathways in a short while. We were also funded um, by the Department of Health to create a video, because I think a lot of us do spend a lot of time explaining to family what preschool asthma is, what does it mean, how do we diagnose it, um, what is the treatment, and perhaps what is the um, natural history. This is all in the video, and you're very welcome to share it with your families um so um we're going to move right through to some challenges with other guidelines but before we move on to primary school asthma guideline are there any questions before we move away from the preschool asthma well people are thinking about questions i just want to highlight anna marie who's one of our consumers comment the fact that um, because her daughter didn't get a firm diagnosis of asthma, it was viral induced, and um, people still don't necessarily um, believe that she has asthma. And I think that's really important of messaging. Sometimes labels are useful um, to cement understanding and, and education. So thank you, Anne Marie, for bringing that up. Um, so the other clinical practice guideline that was led by um, our pedi another pediatrician in the complex asthma service was Dr. Jo Lawrence. She wrote the primary school um, ongoing asthma ongoing management CPG. Um, and I think that's probably a guideline we're most familiar with. There wasn't any major changes. I just want to highlight that in the maintenance therapy of part of that guideline, that for tickers on 50 micrograms of flixotype junior is no longer on the PBS. Um, Shif, you got your hand up? Oh, I was just going to say, it's not on the PBS to initiate in yep. primary school. So if, if someone starts it in preschool and you're continuing it on, anyone can prescribe it with a streamlined authority. But in you can't initiate it in the um, primary school age group on the PBS. I have to say, speaking to our junior doctors who are not aware of this, we haven't run into too much problems, mainly because even on a private script in most chemists, the price difference isn't very big. But this is important to be mindful of because the more vulnerable group of families on healthcare cards um, do have out-of-pocket cost, which is more significant than previous. So it's something to keep in mind of when initiating maintenance of preventative treatment in this age group, that the alternative would be if they require higher dose would be flexotype 125 microgram, 
Or the other alternative, which I think we are studying more and more often now, is ciclosanite or Elvesco, um, 80 microgram. And I find that this is a useful one because it's once a day. And I find that adherence is easier. It's much easier to give a child once a day puff than twice a day. Um, puffers, um, oh, sorry, did I? I'm just going to stop sharing. Something's gone um, funny with my teams. Um, so mindful about using ciclosanide is the other alternative being once a day. It's meant to be a smaller particle, ideally going to the lungs and have less, less side effects. One of the issues one of our doctors, um, junior doctors have raised and Shiva is worth to get your thoughts on this. We know some families have some um, adherence can be tricky, particularly with twice a day, but they on Flixotide um, Junior, which recommends one puff or two puff twice a day. The question is, if you were really, really struggling, um, especially for younger children, is two puff once a day works as well as one puff twice a day? Yeah, it's a good question. So for um for budesonide uh, inhaled, uh, there is very good evidence that two puffs once a day is the equivalent to one puff twice a day so once a day dosing and twice a day dosing are the same for inhaled budesonide uh so i based on that it is reasonable to expect that and and that's definitely true in adults i'm actually not sure of that i can't remember the age group of that study so whether how much that involved pediatrics but i, I think based on that it is reasonable to expect that fluticasone would perform the same way but it's not to my knowledge, been proven um, as definitively as it has for for budesonide. In in practice, I don't. Um, if a family is really struggling to take, if twice a day medication is a deal breaker, I just put them on ciclosanide, which is meant to be given once a day. Thank you. I think my screen has gone back to okay to share again. I will try that again. Apologies. Perfect. All right. And then the other um, issue that's brought up on the ground um, regarding the primary school clinical practice guideline is we haven't included the option of using rescue oral, cort oral cortical steroids at home. And some children with more well-established, older children with well-established asthma, their families are more familiar with managing it, have previous had it. So I think the question is whether that's still okay to use in those families that already have that plan. I know we want to minimize the use of oral cortical steroids, but in some families, it seems to just minimize the severity and allow them to manage it at home. So I just want to bring that for discussion as it's not in the current guideline. Uh, I I can comment on that. And actually, I'll just quickly comment on the ciclesonide because um, a pharmacist uh, gave me a piece of information which is very helpful. So one of the main barriers to ciclesonide is the fact that the the MDI has a circular mouthpiece, which means that not all spaces are not all spaces are compatible. And one of the things is as soon as you tell a family that, then they say, oh, well, which space spaces should I get? And I never knew the answer to that question. So a pharmacist um, uh, helped by saying that the bre it's called the breath a tech, um, so breath hyphen a hyphen tech um, spacer, which is apparently widely available and not super expensive, like in the similar cost to other spaces is uh, compatible with the ciclesonide MDI. And so that's a good one to direct families to. There are a couple of other ones, but they're not as widely available. So so I, I think it's very helpful to be able to tell a family, like if you're going down that route to look for a breath or tech spacer, and I think they're available online as well. So that that's uh, a handy piece of information I recently came across. Regarding the use of re rescue oral corticosteroids, I'm a little bit conflicted. Um, so there is there is good evidence from a randomized control trial that was run out of RCH uh, a while ago that shows that the use of oral corticosteroids reduces healthcare utilization. So as in families need to see GP, sorry, the use of parent initiated oral corticosteroids at home um, yeah, reduces healthcare utilization. So less trips to the GP, less trips to the ED. And I think that's a really important outcome. The, the downside is that in general, we want to um, 
do, we don't want to promote a reliance on rescue therapy with oral corticosteroids, and we want to promote the use of preventers and regular review of asthma to uh, optimize asthma control to reduce the need for oral corticosteroids. So how you manage that is a bit difficult, but I think if you have a family um, uh, whereby, you know, they can see you regularly, they're well engaged, you're like trying to find the right level of preventive therapy. And as part of that process and relationship, you think uh, parent initiated oral corticosteroids is reasonable. I, I, I would be, I think that's a reasonable thing to do. Thanks, Christy? Just wondering if any uh, of the community practitioners have processes that they go through on that, because I think that is something that we all differ from a little bit. I certainly give it to um, professional asthma patients who um, have treated their asthma for years. They know what they're doing, and I really trust not for anything else. I've just seen them with wheeze. I know they know when their kid's wheezing and it's asthma and they're not. And the other thing I always make sure is when I'm going through the asthma plans, which were updated um, on the back of ICAM last year, that in the moderate and severe sections, they really understand that if you start your kid on oral corticosteroids, I really don't want them to wait a week to see me. It's it's a holding measure to get them to me um, or somebody uh, to see them and really stress that we will see asthma all day long. Um, I think people still don't want to bother the GP. They certainly don't want to go to the emergency department. But I really stress to, to patients, one, yeah, I need to know that we're both on the same page about when we use them. And um, if you're giving them, you're also then, you know, in the middle of the night, you're then coming into the practice that day and getting seen by somebody. I'm just in the chat box. Thank you, Narelle. Narelle from National Asthma Council has just shared the link of resources that NAC has developed. There was two packages, one for um, clinicians and one for non-clinical staff, so teachers, sports um, educators regarding the management of asthma. It's interactive. It's a great program, um, and the link is in the chat. So. Moving on, Kirsty, I believe this is over to you to show us the health pathways. Yeah, I think you're muted. Is that better? There we go. <laughs> um, so a lot of you will be familiar with Health Pathways. If you're not, it's a great clinical resource. Uh, I know all the GPs in the room will be because um, I'm sure you will have had a referral rebutted at some point and had you directed to Health Pathways, um, which is frustrating. But sometimes it is useful. And in this case, it is. So I'll show you. Um, you pop down to Child Health, uh, get down to Respiratory, and then it's in acute uh, well there's children asthma and children and um adolescents and this is brilliant this is basically updated guidelines of everything that we have been talking about in the last year um and it has acute management as well um so if you haven't seen acute asthmatic for a while um so that's a that's a really good look to uh, page look maybe you don't see a lot of kids i sometimes speak to gps who just don't have um kids in their demographic very much so if you're feeling a bit rusty that's a great one to update yourself on um wheeze in children age one to five is also really good i would just say just to clarify the point um it's all what we've been talking about i believe it is being updated however there is a light area uh, if I can find it um that talks again about using oral steroids in this age group and just to reiterate what um, we've been saying this is not an age group that we're, we're starting oral steroids in the community if a kid needs oral steroids then they need to be in hospital for monitoring <clears throat> oh I think Scott's raising his hand here feel free to unmute yourself Scott yeah, you're stealing my thunder. They're about to be <laughs> launched in the next two weeks. Uh, we oh, them to uh, align with the CPGs, and I've um, because the uh, we've we've had a lot of pushback from the um, health pathways on this, but um, 
we actually have managed to finally get through that we actually separated asthma and children and separate we've got a new one on adolescence and a new one on asthma in primary school age children and so and it's going to be a lot a little bit less wordy than this we've, i've tried to make it really simple but incorporate some of the excellent cpg algorithms uh that i think are very useful um and we've also renamed the wheezing one to five year old to preschool asthma so um they're all going to be um there in the next if they're actually on the draft site if any of you clever people have access to the draft site uh they're starting to populate there um and um so yes so they're, they're going to be updated very very shortly <clears throat> Thank you so much, Scott. And I say this, uh, it really is a brilliant guideline. Sometimes I get lost in health pathways, um, but this one is is really good. And this is the acute asthma and children that I was talking about as well. So you just, know you've got someone coming in. To up, can you just drop down to the acute respiratory illness in children? Acute respiratory illness in children. There we go. So this pathway, which I don't think is the only pathway, I think, in the world that talks about coughs and colds in kids. Um, it's actually, we looked everywhere for this and we couldn't find it, but we developed this last year because of the uh, large amount of um, inappropriate antibiotics that have been used in primary care for kids with coughs and colds and also the oral steroids that are used for coughs. And, and so uh, we really made this guideline on when to use medications and very much how to actually manage um, common complications of coughs and colds. And how to put it all in so this is a pathway that i don't think is being used very much because it's sort of um uh it's only been fairly new but it was in response to safer care victoria who really were concerned about the over over prescription of um antibiotics that were being used in primary health care and um and so this was this is very much being looked at by quite a few um experts that um go basically it's a very simple guide on what are the what are the uh, complications and trying to take the um, take GPs answer the GPs questions on uh, the fact that there isn't any evidence for um, just in case antibiotics. There really doesn't have it doesn't lessen the incidence of um, invasive bacterial respiratory illnesses. Uh, it increases side effects, and so we've gone through a fair bit of that. But I just wanted to plug that one because I think it's a good starting point for GPs if you want to have a look at it and take it back to your practice um, and then launch into the um, the asthma ones. But anyway, I just thought I wanted to mention that one, that it's uh, got a lot of information in there that's about when you should do things and when you shouldn't. I think it's really useful as well, Scott, because um, asthmatic patients also come in with coughs or colds. And that's kind of what I was mentioning before. Sometimes you will get parents who bring them in saying they're coughing and they're breathless but it's not actually asthma. They've got pneumonia or they've got something else. I know Catherine's mentioned that and I'm sure the children's do see that. I often use health pathways um, to um, discuss with parents who often get antibiotics and steroids to show them guidelines. So I'll sit and walk through it with them, print out the guidelines, say, look, this is a resource that we use a lot um, and concerns. And, and, and on the case of antibiotics, I would also agree, there has been a rec the recent increase in serious bacterial infections. I don't know what's happened in the last month. I'm sure the hospital will have seen it as well. But um, I've never seen so many chest infections and pneumonias, and I've never prescribed so many antibiotics. So I don't know what's going on this spring, but I've probably prescribed more antibiotics this month than I have all year. Um, so yeah, just things to watch out in your asthmatic patients if they're not getting better. I think, is this actually a bacterial infection? Kids often don't come in breathless or feverish. The ones I see are usually pale. Um, yeah, they are tach tachycardic, vomiting often. Um, so to think about um, yeah, pneumonia and bacterial infections uh, when it is appropriate as well. Thank you for that. Because right. you brought up a really good point, because the case of the 19-month-old boy I just presented got better, went home. However, in the next week, got worse again, exactly what you say, because viruses can predispose to bacteria. He developed high fevers. He was pale. He was tachypneic. He was hypoxic. And he developed a bacterial pneumonia as a complication. So, yes, it could be asthma, but it, it could also have the usual complications of a bacterial pneumonia, too. It's important to keep that in mind. Yeah, and I think we see that a lot in general practice, the double dip is a, a double 
viral infection and actually they're fine they just got something else or actually in the second week are they significantly worse they look worse than they did the week before and they have that crucial peak of they seem to be getting better and then they crashed which we see a lot um so that is a very useful page for everybody um now I need to figure out how to stop screen sharing and then re-share with something else. So bear with me. I think we're going back to... Because uh, I think it's me, isn't it, to do the um, bit of a data, data update. Scott, is that a legacy hen? Or have you got um, a comment or question? I'm going to assume that's a legacy hen at this point. Okay, right. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what we hope to do in this community of practice whenever is available, we would like to use data to help guide our process um, of our clinical care um, and quality improvement. This is just to raise awareness that the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare has just released their most recent data on chronic respiratory illness, particularly asthma. This is very, very busy and I'll just highlight a few things. This incorporates um, children and adults and that's relevant to a lot of you online which look after the whole spectrum of life on that ship and different from Shiv and I. Um, so the prevalence of asthma at this point in terms of self-reported, it's still pretty similar, about 11% of Australian. What highlighted to me is quite a big proportion of people with asthma do report high levels of psychological distress. Um, I think in hospital we see big spectrums of illnesses and maybe sometimes it's easy to think that that's a relatively, relatively mild illness, but it does impact the quality of life and families um, with children living with asthma. Um, we do still see death in asthma. It is very, very rare, um, but it does occur. And sometimes in children and adults, I think that are not even pre um, that you wouldn't have predicted it. Sometimes they are relatively mild and never been in hospital before and suddenly present with very significant severe attacks. And that's important to keep in mind. Going back to Shiv's point about thinking about how do we better improve the preventative use in health corticosteroids rather than reliance of oral corticosteroids and beta agonists. I think that may um, hopefully reduce some of the unexpected death. Um, with this slide, again, what was um, jumped out at, at me was, um, I think it was in this slide, uh, the asthma cycle of care claims. And I just, with my GP colleagues on board, um, wanted to understand whether that's still something that's possible to use, because it seems as if there's less and less Australians claiming it, but I wonder whether it is just the availability of the use of the asthma cycle of claim um, for the M PBS, MBS. I um, will claim ignorance here on MBS. I still am R I M G. The MBS still confounds me. Um, I've never, I've never done one. I don't even know if we still. Uh, maybe the asthma nurses who work in practice will know. Can we even still claim them? Are they even a thing for us? Kate Shepherd said the cycle of care paperwork is too cumbersome, so we don't do it. Everything's too cumbersome, it is. So um, something we did talk about last time is how um, care plans, good old care plans. Um, we also don't do them for asthma because of the stringent requirement. It's quite hard to get a four-year-old to have two other providers um, to qualify for a care plan. So things we did talk about last time, which I've been doing more because it does give you the time to spend a really long time with patients educating them about asthma because it takes ages um is uh referrals to the community asthma program so that counts as a provider um asthma educator uh your practice nurse or pharmacist to do inhaler technique because the recommendation is every three months getting that checked and they might not be able to get an appointment with the gp so we have a pharmacist in-house so we use her quite a lot and um, to do reviews every three months um so that is something that i think can be utilized more but i don't know if anybody else actually knows there's a lot of the cycle of clear cycle of care claims that have just kind of been disbanded we're not allowed mm. to, nobody ever tells you there's no formal word that goes out it's sort of by the bush radio that says oh you're not allowed to do that anymore 
Um, there's just a question here, if you don't mind me asking, because it's yeah. our, our first clinical question of the day. Thank you, Pramila. Um, so maybe uh, I'll give this to Catherine O'Shiv. The use of Predmix um, three days in a toddler if a cough doesn't subside and if they're not on regular preventers. So feel free to unmute yourself if you want to chat about it, Pramila, or clarify in the comments. But from that, I'm taking that this is a child who is just still coughing at night post viral possibly for weeks and from my understanding that is still asthma symptoms and um trialing ventolin to see if it settles the cough but if you are convinced it's asthma symptoms then you should trial a preventer and um, i'll let catherine and shiv as the experts clarify that or if you have more information on on the scenario that would be fantastic thank you shiv do you want to take this one uh, sorry, I was trying to read about something I saw about the cycle of care. The cycle of care items disappear, disappeared as of November 2022, is what this GP said on Twitter. Anyway. There you go. That's Obviously, it's just a after very, that. <laughs> yeah, very reputable source. Um, uh, sorry, okay, Predmix for toddler for a cough. So, so I guess the first thing is if you thought the cough was asthma, I would that would not be an indication for Predmix because uh as we said in preschools, we don't use um don't recommend the use of prednisolone for, for management of uh, asthma exacerbations. So I guess what what um and so I, I can't really the only I guess the main condition that we treat with steroids in the community which presents with cough is croup, but outside of croup, I don't I don't think I would um you use prednisolone. And I think like we were saying before, and if you're new to the um the ICAM, that is where we're wondering why are they still coughing? And if you think this is an asthma cough and asthma yep. symptoms, yep. asking about breathlessness, wheezy episodes. So we would call this interval symptoms, because a post-viral cough can easily last mm -hmm. four weeks. But if this is a cough that is really sort of going on and it's nocturnal or morning and dry or seasonal or when they're running around, or when uh, other cases that we've had in the last year, um, heavily spiced food is being cooked, um, when the dog's there, things that seem to trigger it, um, and it's just this dry, ongoing asthmatic type cough, videos of the cough sound asthmatic, um, maybe this is asthma, and you do need to have a think about preventer. Um, Thank you, Janine, you're leaving. <laughs> I've got a question from Scott and needs a great tip on GPs, which mm. the preferred asthma action plan is easy to use in best practice software. We have recently updated our best practice with the updated asthma action plan from Asthma Australia. Um, so that was updated last year on the back of all of these projects. Um, I'm finding it really easy to use, really intuitive. Um, I don't know if the asthma nurses have um any other ones national asthma council one um is great as well we just don't have that one embedded so i don't know how easy it is to embed i think scott brought up a really um important point as we can see on the data really the percentage of people with an action plan hasn't really increased um over the years and we all know it just takes quite a long time if you have to hand fill most of it and i think most of it is still hand Feel a big, um, and I don't know whether Asthma Australia is here. They were working on a few software providers to embed it in order to draw the information straight into the software that can make that quicker. Um, in the hospital system, we've been encouraging our staff to use our embedded electronic medical record because it does draw a lot of information, minimize the time that need to fill out. Um, and therefore it's already on the system the next time the child come in. I think we can't underestimate the amount of time it requires for that just to practicalities of filling out the action plan. You know, I would just take this opportunity as well um, to say for people who might not be aware um, at uh, February is coming up <laughs> when people come saying my kid can't go to school because they don't have their school action plan and um, people may not be aware um, that school Victoria school specific action plan is no longer required and does not exist the link that I've just put in the chat is the updated asthma Australia action plan again the National Asthma Council NAC asthma plan if you google it um, 
is also very good. You can just print two copies of that and be very firm in saying that is an asthma plan um, and the school can use that. Um, it's in the Vic Edu guidelines. So if you, the kind of if there's any pushback, you can signpost them to that. Um, and the other point is I often get people in saying my asthma action plan has expired. So my child is not allowed to go to camp, school, daycare. They don't expire. You'll see if you look at that link at the top is review date. And I'm usually really firm that is a review for clinical review of asthma. It's not a redo the same piece of paperwork. So the school's got one with dates on it. Um, and I don't do a review unless the patient's there, because often you'll get a parent in saying, can you please just do this because you can't go to school? So I usually write a little uh, letter to the school saying, dear school, the asthma plan is in date. It has not been reviewed, though, and it will be reviewed when I see the patient. If the patient can go to school. Please refer to the Vic Edu website. Things have changed. Thank you for your understanding. Yours. Um, so just a practical aspect for GPs there on asthma action plans to make your life a bit easier as opposed to filling out 24 different pieces of paper every February 2nd of every year. Narelle just added the link to the National Asthma Council's Libraries of Action Plan. Uh, and just so that um, we haven't spent much time discussing the adolescent management because we had a whole um, communal practice before, but we're happy to bring that back again. As we all know, the best practice um, guideline for adolescents is to use the combined um, anti-inflammatory reliever therapy, Simbacort, that we have in Australia. To my knowledge, National Asthma Council is the only Simba Court action plan that I'm aware of. Unless anyone know of any other um, Simba Court action plan to share, but that is the only one I'm aware of. And that would be the only one um, at this point that you could use to download for adolescents. Um, there is the SMART action plan, which I use for adults, which I can use for adolescents as well. Um, I think Kevin said from Asthma Australia they were they were looking to do more work this year, weren't they? To do because there were so many differences now between the age groups. So that's maybe a TBC. And I'm glad Anne Marie that that helps. Um, it is the plague of uh, every parent. Asthma, uh, allergy plans for things that aren't allergies, but the kids can't eat. Um, <laughs> It is the, the bane of parents and GPs' lives, the old uh, school paperwork, so I'm glad that helps. Um, do we have anything more to talk about this anymore? Um... I think we are good. Could I just make Sorry. one quick yep. point about that, that care indicators? There were two stats on the first or the top of the table which are really worrying about the quality or the outcomes exactly. for people with asthma. So one is, I think it's 18% of people dispense three or more canisters of salbutamol per year. And ideally, you know, uh, one canister of salbutamol should last you a whole year. So, you know, one in five ha are using um, much more than we want. And that trend isn't, is, isn't improving with time. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, you know, during the pandemic with social distancing, uh, a lot of, asthma exacerbations disappeared because there were no viral infections. So these numbers all should look a lot better because this period covers that. And then two, um, or I think maybe they adjusted their dates. But anyway, and then two, if someone's on a preventer, they probably need to dispense more than three per year to actually be adherent. And only a third of people who are prescribed a preventer kind of dispense three or more. So it, it kind of speaks to an over-reliance on SABA or, and an under, under utilization of adherence, which is kind of, just further evidence of what we're trying to address here. Thanks, Shiv. So hopefully with our work together, we want to use data to show that we have um, made these changes and see some improvement in these numbers as time um, goes by. Bye. Um, Kirsty, shall I hand that over to you to um, talk about allergic rhinitis? Oh, it's Come back. I am sorry, having some technical issues. My screen has just gone black. I can hear you all. Um, can anybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I've, we just, just can't called see the you. IT guy. Oh, no, so you're good. Can you see me now? Yeah, you're back. IT support has magically fixed it from the kitchen. So <laughs> um, <laughs> if it goes black again, well, <laughs> we'll, 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 
get that sorted out. Right, okay, everybody can see me. Okay, um, let me just try and fix this. Um, oh, Narelle's written there, uh, great that asthma action plan should be reviewed and updated six monthly for children and 12 monthly for adolescents. Yeah, uh -huh. and I think that's the messaging really for schools. It's um, it, It's got nothing to do with the dates. It's to do with the clinical review of the child that's what's important so um if people are bringing in the piece of paper it, it, you need to bring in the kid we need to actually do an asthma review so um i'm going to try and share my screen now uh, right people see things so uh review of allergic rhinitis guidelines so um, again, we had a brilliant session about this time last year, timely for seasonal rhinitis. As we all know, the area starts with the nose. And as we all probably know, especially if, if you live in West Melbourne, it's hay fever season. Um, so types of allergic rhinitis, seasonal pollens all year round, dust mites, molds, animal danders. And the symptoms, rhinorrhea, congestion, itchy nose, itchy watery eyes. Um, and if you improve the control of allergic rhinitis, you can improve asthma control. So I'll give a little case here. Um, I saw Jo from Community Asthma Programme, which is great because she sees this patient. And a nice conversation we had the other day, four-year-old asthmatic, family history of asthma. They're brilliant and they um, engage with everything and they're very well educated. And they went to the shops the other day and they came out and it was hot and it was gusty. Mum's asthmatic, daughter's asthmatic. And they both start cough, 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 coughing. And she's only ever had infection, uh, asthma and wheezing related to infections, the four-year-old. And she uses her Ventolin really well in those episodes and she's never needed preventer. So mum came in saying, do you think she's got hay fever? Hay fever? Do you think that's triggering asthma? And it had all settled down. She didn't need to use her ventolin by the time they got home so I've had a chat and I said does she have a sniffy you know nose runny nose and she kind of looked at me and said she's a four-year-old at daycare Kirsty and I said hmm okay point taken does she rub her eyes she's like she's a four-year-old at daycare Kirsty so we went through all the symptoms and had a bit of a laugh well how do you diagnose allergic symptoms in a four-year-old in a preschooler it's quite hard um, obviously, if you are highly topic or you've been lucky enough to have RAS tests done and your eczema gets really bad every time you roll in the cut grass, there's, there's some really obvious cases, which I don't think I need to go through. I think most people would have them down, you know, as allergy. We have a, a, a red pollinating tree around the corner from the practice and every spring people walk past and then walk straight in with big swollen faces. They're probably allergic to it. Um, but I do find that quite difficult um, in this time of year in Truganina with the amount of allergy burden we have. So my approach is, let's presume she probably does have a bit of seasonal rhinitis. There's no harm in giving her an antihistamine. We could do a blood test, but we always need a clinical correlation to actually see if that blood test is any worse, uh, any worth. Um, uh, because obviously you can have a reaction or, on a RAS, but not necessarily have a clinical reaction. Um, and the whole family is taking antihistamines, um, the, the older children and, and the parents at this point. So um, Shiv, again, your input would be appreciated. But I said, look, why don't we just start turn Zyrtec? Because allergic rhinitis, hay fever kids who have asthma really should be taking uh, an antihistamine on high pollen days um, and in Truganina from September to January, that's every day. Um, so I'd like your opinion on that. Um, the way I usually describe it is this is no asthma symptoms and this is asthma symptoms. And if you have chronic sniffy itchy nose, you're sitting here just underneath your threshold of wheezing and coughing and struggling to breathe. And if we can give you a daily antihistamine and an into a nasal corticosteroid, we can just bring you back down to here and stop your asthma flaring as much. So that's the sort of conversation I had with them and said, well, let's at least try an antihistamine. What, what would you have done in that scenario when you're not sure, but you think it might be? Kissy Mel asks a really good question here on whether you would recommend checking the nasal turbinates when you know there's perhaps a bit of a diagnostic dilemma. I I do I do look at kids' nasal turbinates, but again it came back to she's four, 
Mm. She's always got a snotty, sniffy nose that looks inflamed. So yeah, bigger kids who I think of rhinitis always, always, always look up their nose. Um, we never look up kids' noses, but I do. Um, and if it's not springtime, you know, and I think they've got year-round rhinitis, so I do. But a four-year-old looking up their nose, it's, I mean, I've got a three and a five-year-old, the noses are always snotty. So yeah, I think it is a really useful thing to do. But um, in this age group, when you're picking it apart, my thoughts are just give them an antihistamine. You're not going to do any harm and it might help. Intranasal corticosteroids, it's hard. If they're definitely, I usually would say I pick up the rhinitis ones. They're the, all through the consult and, and the parents are usually like, they're always like that. Um, so if they come in and they're like that, but again, giving a four-year-old an intranasal corticosteroid is difficult. So I usually start with an oral antihistamine first and then sort of monitor and we have to think about it um, because last thing you want to do is give a four-year-old uh, intranasal corticosteroid and it go wrong and then they scream and refuse it for the rest of their life which is also an issue so I kind of save the nasal corticosteroid for slightly older groups when I'm more convinced but yeah it's particularly the preschoolers which um, confound me a little bit. Any other advice any other GPs clinicians have a, a good way to differentiate seasonal allergies? Um. I was just going to add before we moved on to your question, Pramila, um, my practice in this area has slightly changed a little bit um, due to the missed randomized control trial, which randomized children. This is done um, at, at, in Melbourne and children that refer to a tertiary service to see an ENT surgeon um, or special services, they have significant symptoms. And these children were randomized to either just intranasal saline or inhaled corticosteroids. And the results were surprisingly interesting. I would have expected the inhaled corticosteroids group to have improved. However, the improvement in both groups were actually very, very similar. So some of my families who may be reluctant for steroids or for whatever reason, um, I sometimes just go, why don't we just try some saline nasal sprays and see how you go? And surprisingly, some family seems to improve just with nasal nasal spray. So that's been a recent change in my practice. Pramila has put the question here, um, what is the best steroid nasal spray, how often and how long it should be used? Um, I often use practically over-the-counter Nasonax just because the price has come down. It's easy to get. You don't need a prescription. That tend to be my first one to start. And I would often say at least four to six weeks because you don't see any difference within a few days. And how long to use? If it's really effective, some of my families stay on it pretty much during the whole spring and with no issues at all. If you use the right technique, and there's lovely videos online of aiming the spray, not the inside, but to towards your ear tips or spraying it away from the inside towards the ear, you often don't get side effects of um, of blood, um, of epistaxis. Kirsty, I... do, do you have a favorite one? Yeah, News Next Junior. It's just easy. Everybody knows it. Um, so I always start with that. I think um, there's a few things here. If you're trialing, I definitely say four to six weeks. You can't really assess anything before that. Um, we had some really great allergy speakers talk over the last year. And I think I'm specifically talking about the trials you're not sure. When you know a child has hay fever, they're a bit older, you know they have asthma, or even if a child has year-round rhinitis as we said so on that last slide um house dust mite mold animal danders and if you're not sure you can test you can order a rest test it's really easy it's minimally invasive and if you have clinical suspicion it really helps cement that diagnosis the guidance is three to six months minimum so if you think they have that re year round your trial is longer than that you really want to see is the snoring getting better is the asthma getting better are they stopped being sniffy um, I think four weeks is quite low, but last year, yeah, our, our allergy speakers really said these kids need to be on it for three to six months before you consider taking them off it. And the other thing to sort of really um, let parents know, obviously, with the long term inhaled corticosteroids, there is concern over growth and side effects and things. But if their asthma needs to be controlled, there's more risk in not controlling their asthma. 
for the nasal corticosteroids, we don't worry about any of that. It doesn't show any long term growth side effects like that. So you can give it really happily um, and reassure them that apart from occasionally a little bit of bleeding nose. And again, if you have kids, when is their nose not bleeding? Um, that uh, it's, it's not really got major significant side effects, but it could significantly improve their asthma control. And then I think the second line is a virus, which is um, which is licensed um, for, correct me if I'm wrong, over fives. Um, I think if I miss this over fives, so maybe somebody else can, I always have to look it up. Um, so did you say Avemis? Is that uh, what yeah, you Yeah, sorry, Avemis, yeah. yeah. Avemis with a Scottish accent. Yeah. <laughs> so the Avemis <laughs> I tend to use for my younger kids, mainly because that nose part seems to be smaller and fits little noses a little bit better. So some of my little preschoolers who might find the nasal necks that, that nose bit too big to fit into their nose and find that scary. Um, I would suggest using Avemis, but it, as you say, you need to scrap. It's relatively pricey, um, even on a scrap. Um, so um, I don't use that a lot, particularly how Nasonex, how accessible Nasonex Junior yeah. is. Yeah, and then for older kids, adolescents, Demista is still, I think, one of the best products on the market. I've linked there the National Asthma Council how to deliver a nasal spray the RCH also has that and I think it's on health pathways as well I usually just show them a picture of the anatomy and say there's nothing up there it's all back here you put your elbows on your knees and you look at the floor it has to point upwards but you have to look downwards um, and we have a bit of a laugh and, um, uh, and, and, and try and show people that way and um, Kate has asked about Monty Lucas in primary school age group for asthma and allergic rhinitis um, yep, it's on the it's on the stepwise pathway, um, Kate, for asthma. Um, I think the main concerns are side effects. I think it's about seventeen percent gets agitation um, and and sleep disturbance and psychiatric side effect, behavioural side effect. I have quite a lot of people discontinuing it actually. But yes, I think inhaled corticosteroids are first and then and Monte Lucas is an add-in is fine. For allergic rhinitis, I have seen that used. Um, but uh, only from specialist sector. I've never seen it used in primary care. I think if I had a kid who wasn't responding to if I miss Avamis. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, an antihistamine and um, the preventer therapy. I'm not sure if I would start Monte Lucas just for allergic rhinitis. What's what's the pediatrician's view on that? Yeah, I don't tend not to start Monte Lucas just for allergic rhinitis for that reason. Often if they do have asthma, it's an added bonus. Um, to be honest, most of my families do end up stopping it, even though, as you rightfully say, it's 17%. It feels like it's almost 100% of my patients <laughs> who start Monte Lucas as some kind of behavior. Um, disturbance or sleep disturbance and tend not to last very long on Montelukas. Anyway. So I do tend to, if it's just allergic rhinitis, really continue on that nasal spray and adding in the antihistamines as necessary. And just a brief word here. Oh, sorry, Chef. I was just going to say it, it's one in 17, so not 17%. Because oh, okay. that would be about 17% would be about roughly one in five. So uh, yeah. So it's not quite that bad. Okay. Thanks but but, uh, but, in, uh, but I agree with you that in practice, I think particularly because then people start Google and then they mm -hmm. want to stop it. But um, I, I think actually Kate's highlighted a point that uh, you know there's a lot of bad publicity about Montelukas, but one of the good things about it is it's probably like I can imagine if I was a parent, it would be it could be potentially very hard to get a kid to take an inhaled steroid and an intranasal steroid every day. So in a child who has a both asthma and allergic rhinitis and a requirement for both. I can, I actually think one of the good things about Montelukas probably you might be able to treat both. So in a patient, in a parent who was making a fully, it's something I would offer a family and, and highlight the side, behavioral side effect risk, and then kind of make a decision together with them. I, there are, there, there are the odd kids who respond beautifully to it. And then it's just so easy, but, um, uh, but you have to make sure they're fully informed. Um, I'm going to plug Shiv's service here. <laughs> <So, laughs> Shiv did 
a wonderful talk on what he does. Um, and uh, if you aren't feeling confident about decisions like that, and you're like, oh, I don't know, um, complex patients with asthma that's uncontrolled, allergic rhinitis that's uncontrolled, that you've got involved with the community asthma program, you're like, I'm still not sure if I'm getting here. Is Montelukas the right thing? Is it the wrong thing? Maybe I don't use it that much. Maybe I'm not sure. Maybe the parent's not sure. You can refer to um, the RCH. That would be a suitable referral um, if you're in catchment or sunshine if you're not. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I just thought I'd plug your service there, Shiv. So complex asthma that has is uncontrolled. There's concerns about... Um, uh, communication or family correspondence but there's lots of I mean, complex social reasons why sometimes um, we are not the best people to communicate with family um, or they need that extra help from a respiratory physician um, or that that's a yeah totally appropriate referral because uh, I don't think we re refer too many kids in with asthma on its own. Um, and on uh, specialist uh, services uh, treatment, we've gone through the above, the allergen immunotherapy. Um, this is really vogue in our practice. Um, there's loads of people who ask about this. My salient takeaways were um, appropriate for severe cases not responding. Sorry, when I say salient takeaways, we, we had a whole topic about this um, last year. Um, severe cases not responding to above that you know have proven allergens, so there is no just desensitisation, and it can reduce it up to 50%, which is quite significant. Um, uh, it is quite difficult and expensive, though, so it's kind of not something that you would offer to every kid with hay fever and asthma if parents ask about it. Any questions about that? move on um oh we're oh look we're running out of time um so this is the allergic rhinitis um uh, uh plan that you can do for kids um to take to school and for um daycare and that's the link there the community asthma program which <laughs> i feel like is every second sentence out my uh mouth but it is amazing if you're in catchment it's dhhs funded it's a free service for children under 18 with asthma even if this is the first time you've diagnosed with asthma and you're at minute eight of your 10 to 12 minute consult uh, get them to come back do the referral um it's a, uh, do we have the details there well, that's a shame. Um, in the email that we send out, we'll get you the details. If you Google Community Asthma Programme West Melbourne, you'll get through to the CoHealth website and it's all there. There is a referral form that you can download or you can just write a letter. Um, but it's a brilliant service. I'm eternally grateful to all uh, the lovely people who work there who are almost all <laughs> on here tonight. Um, and we have, I think, worked really well together um, in educating our patients and we get constant feedback both ways saying that the education is really cemented and strong and people understand it and especially in that emerging um diagnosis it's, it's really useful um the other great service is the 1800 asthma service which i didn't know about before i started doing this project so this is a nine to five monday to friday free service you've just had um an asthma consult you think oh maybe i've not communicated everything i need to tell them about this number, they can go home and phone the asthma service and ask them. It's not an acute management service. So it's not my kid's wheezy, what do I do? It's I've just had, a, my child's just had a diagnosis of asthma and I need to clarify inhaler technique, medications, asthma education. They get through to an asthma educator straight away um, and they get emailed with an um, asthma education plan as well. Cassie, I might interrupt you for yeah. just a short while. Hannah's got her hand up. Oh. Hi there, sorry, um, didn't want to interrupt you as you're talking. I just wanted to add a little bit um, around the community asthma program at CoHealth. So I'm at CoHealth, um, which is a community health organisation in the north and west, um, and we are running some promotion information sessions at the moment um, for services who aren't um, aware of the community asthma program, so I am able to offer that. I'll, in the chat, just put in um, some links to the um, community asthma program and if any and the referral form and um, the registration link if if anyone 
here tonight would like to find out a little bit more about the program I'm happy to organize that with you so thank you that was all Thanks, that Hannah. would be fantastic. Thank you, Hannah. And again, for the GPs amongst us looking for more time um, to discuss that, the Community Asthma Programme can be part of a care plan as a referred service. So really useful there. Um, and just as we move on to resources for Thunderstorm, I am in the office in the garden and the wind is picking up. Um, so Thunderstorm Asthma, I'll let you read that. Um, it was basically a nightmare, I think is what that is summarised as. Um, unprecedented asthma event that nobody ever thought would or could happen um, hadn't been conceptualised um, and we know it can happen and it might happen again. We don't want to um, catastrophize, but we do want people to be aware. The same as um, we know tsunamis happen, other natural disasters happen. We just want you to know they exist and to be prepared if you're in an at-risk area. Um, since then, there's been a lot of resource planning um, and a lot of services that you may or may not be aware of. Um, uh, reducing exposure. So people should just be aware of thunderstorm asthma. Maybe you work in a population that has a high migrate population like I do, and they weren't here in 2017. They don't know it exists. So let your asthmatic patients know in the same way as you can say aerosols might trigger you, strongly spiced food being cooked um, and being uh, up in the steam in the kitchen might trigger you. Thunderstorms can trigger you. Um, and you can give them basic advice. Um, one season in Melbourne is enough to know what happens when the wind gets up. The wind gets up, you go inside, you close the doors, you turn off your air con. Um, you don't need too much technology. You can just step outside and hear and see the winds getting up. Um, and it should just be kind of social practice. And there's Bureau of Meteorology forecasts and lots of apps that we'll talk about. Um, I won't explain this diagram, but basically there's a big storm that swells up um, the pollen and then the wind breaks it all apart and blows it into people's respiratory systems, causing uh, asthma attacks. Um, improved ability to self-manage. Make it part of your asthma plan. So when you're doing your care plan and educating people, educate them about that, what to do. People with hay fever be aware of this risk, and this speaks to the point I made before, especially for older populations who aren't asthmatic. I was working that night. We had 12 people sharing nebulizers. I know, I know, but it's what we had, um, and spacers um, in a room, and none of them were asthmatic, and all of them are still my patients, and I hadn't met most of them. They were pregnant. They were old. They'd never been asthmatic. They're all still on Simba Court because they are actually asthmatic. They just have a vent on the bottom of a cupboard somewhere, and that goes for adolescents as well. So make sure that if you have atopic patients, they're aware of that, and they are taking their preventer. Um, those who were on preventers were significantly less affected than those who just had a vent in the bottom drawer somewhere. So if it's someone who you know, oh, I forget taking it, dog, it's springtime, please take your Simbacort for all the above reasons we've discussed. Increase asthma's first aid knowledge across the community. Um, there's asthma animations, videos, posters that have gone out and there's been specifically funded um, work done on this. And obviously um, the amazing Nurses of the Asthma Australia um, and National Asthma Council um, and maybe some people can put on some resources there. Um, there's also been a lot of responses within the hospitals. Um, there is people involved about disaster planning on high risk days, uh, surge capacity workforces, monitoring and early detection systems, practically for patients. Download the VIC emergency app and download the um, Melbourne Pollen app. They will both give you an alert to your phone on high pollen days and high thunderstorm asthma days. Both can be triggers for asthma. This is what they look like. This is the Epic Emergency app. app. That's the icon there. You can just get somebody to go into the app store in clinic and get them to download that. And this is what it looks like when the grass pollen is high. Um, and it will tell you specifically if you are in a thunderstorm area because you don't want patients to be terrified of every storm, every high pollen day. This is tools to give them the resources to say, oh, the weather's bad. Do you think it's going to be a thunderstorm asthma day? They can go on and see and they can say, oh, no, there's going to be a storm. So I'll be aware, but it's not a high risk thunderstorm asthma day. Questions? Narelle's put up some great links there. Thank you, Narelle. 
um, as always, <laughs> about thunderstorm asthma. While we're waiting for questions, in the interest of time, I might just flip over to mine for the wrap up. Is that yep. all right, Kirsty? Yep. Okay. All right. Yep. So, so we've reached the end of today's um, session. Um, so your feedback is very important. As I say, with the sustained phase of ICAM, we really want this to be more a collaborative process. Again, this is a very unique platform where all the aspects around the child's or an adult's asthma care is actually in this one forum. It's such a unique opportunity that we could share challenges, difficulties, and also an opportunity to advocate for the patients into changes in the system. As Kirsty, as Schiff, and everyone has mentioned, a lot of resources have come up with us working together, changes in the action plan, advocacy around the PBS and putting um, Flixitite Junior back to the PBS for the preschool asthma. And so lots of opportunities to really make changes in the system and how we care for children and asthma. So your feedback on how we run this for the next three years is really, really important. Now, apologies, the ICAM email does is not functional at this point because the first part of the project has ended. In the email that we send out, we will um, put in some resources on how we communicate with each other in between the community of practice. Sitting behind the community of practice is the working group. Uh, many of us are online today. We represent each of different hospitals and sectors, um, and we will be working in the background and responding to your feedback um, and actioning some of the um, recommendations that come up in this community of practice. So if you wouldn't mind, just in the last minute, um, we will love your feedback. You can scan the QR code um, or we will email you the link. And I think that we will also put the link into the chat. It will be very much appreciated if you could provide us feedback um, in the last few minutes of the community of practice. So I'll just hang in the background while you have a few minutes to complete the survey, please. And in the time being, if there's any questions that come up, you're very welcome to put the questions in the chat and we can respond to that too. So hopefully everyone has a chance to have scanned the QR code or access the link. Um, all right. So just um, in anticipation, the next community of practice would be on November the 22nd. It will be on Wednesday evening. And one of the things that we hope you might feedback for us is whether this time suits. We're never going to find a perfect time that suits everyone. But I guess our question is whether this evening time, I, I know everyone have things on during the day, but many of us do juggle families and young children um, in the background at this time of the night. I guess we're quite keen to hear, um, understand whether um, this kind of evening session suit most people, or would you prefer more of a lunchtime type of session? Although I know that also is tricky for people in the workplace to be able to jump out. So we're quite, quite keen for that feedback in terms of timing of these community of practice. The next one we're going to be talking around reducing household allergens and triggers for asthma, particularly around house dust mite um, and pollution and gas, um, gas cookers. Um, but beyond that, we're open to suggestions what topics you would like us to discuss. Primala, does the link, um, do you mean that the QR code doesn't work or the link um, that the Northwestern PHN Education Link Survey Monkey Link is not working? Yeah, I've just asked the same thing. I clicked on the link for Survey Monkey and I'm in it okay, but I'm on a desktop, so just wondering if it's working uh, on iPhones and iPads. Well, oh no, oh, the, QR, so the QR code's not going to Should we go back to it? Yeah, I will do that again. Okay. Um, 
I think there's an opportunity to do it. It'll be emailed out with the um with the email. Um I'm just yeah. trying to do the QR code here. Yeah. It has worked on my iPhone, but it may be different, yeah. different platforms, different services. That's okay. Yeah, Thank you very good. much for trying. If it doesn't work, then um we will be sending out an email. Um, with the link, with resources, and also an ability to access the recording for today if you do want to go back to any of the resources for tonight. But I think lastly, I want to, on behalf of Kirsty and myself, Northwestern Melbourne PHN and SHIP, I'd like to thank everyone for sacrificing the evening to join us. Um, I, I know we have dominated the discussion today, but really hopefully in future sessions, we welcome your input as much as possible. And hopefully it was of value to you as it was um, of value to us. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much. Have a good night.